Okay, I think we can get started. So welcome everyone. I see familiar faces. Um, I'm looking, I have, I have the camera on to those of you who have turned the camera on so that I can look at someone. So I'm looking at you, Darcy and Stephen, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna be staring right at you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for joining today. I know many of you on this chat, but for those who don't know me, my name is Roshni, she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of Futures, the career office at Hopkins, serving PhDs and postdocs. Uh, if you can mute uh, the your mics, thank you. I'll, it'll be less distracting. I am very, very sleep deprived today, so my brain's all over the place. Thank you for coming to learn tips about cover letters. Like many of you, this was my least favorite part of the job application, mostly because it felt like a huge task compared to creating a resume or a CV, you know, bullet points. And mostly because I wasn't sure how to write it or what to include in it. Since applying for many positions, including postdocs, jobs, and helping so many others over the last few years, I've picked up a few tips and I would like to share those tips with you. So I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but today's audience comprises of graduate students, postdocs uh, in engineering, bio and chem, humanities, social sciences, education, and more. So when I present, I have the unique challenge and opportunity to speak to each of you with your different disciplines. So as we go forward, I have provided examples that could possibly transcend disciplines and industries, but also I've included examples from each industry as well. So as you know, also, I offer personalized consults, editing, um, and you, you already know that. So if you have any specific questions, feel free to ask me. Speaking of questions, when you all registered, you submitted a whole bunch of questions on cover letters. And so I put them in a word cloud, and you'll see for me to understand what I should cover. And there are similar questions. How long? What should I include? What should I focus on? Uh, what do you know? How do I? Uh, how do I balance brevity with impact, things like that. So I have designed the rest of the talk by grouping the questions and uh, I'll answer your questions as we go through. As more questions come up, which I'm sure they will, feel free to add it to the chat box. Um, the slides are only about 38 slides, so we'll have plenty of questions, uh, plenty of room for questions later. Okay, so the overall goal today is to provide you with some ideas on how to write the cover letter and then make some suggestions. At the end of the day, you always want to write a resume cover letter and go through the interview process being yourself and speaking in your voice. So when I send you later templates and things like that, really you want to be able to adopt those in your own way. So I encourage you to take these as suggestions. There is no one way if it's all. If you've come to any of my previous sessions on resumes, or if we've chatted in small groups, you'll hear me say this over and over again, focus on using all opportunities provided to you to tell the employer more about you. So you could in reality be the best person for the role, but they don't know that unless we connect the dots for them. So just like your resume, your cover letter is one more space to tell your professional story. It is not supposed to be a repeat of your resume. It's supposed to be a complement to your resume or CV and other application materials. But 90% of the time, if I read a cover letter, it's basically the resume over and over again. It's supposed to be an accompaniment to your other documents. Um, you, there's no way, real way to know if recruiters, when you're applying to various nonprofits or industry, reads your cover letters or not. There's no way to know. But when I interviewed recruiters recently uh, for the Ask Your Recruiter series, they said that they absolutely do. And I'll show you why in a second. They are able to assess your ability to write and communicate in the cover letter. And it's an opportunity to learn a bit more about you. Within academia, however, a cover letter is an important comp component accompanying your CV. So they often read it um, right in the beginning. When a job or internship is asking for a cover letter, absolutely you have to send one. When a job or internship is not asking for a cover letter, it's always a good idea to include one. And the reason being, if imagine there are two equally good resumes, and sometimes when I'm on LinkedIn and I'm looking at some of the engineering jobs at Apple, Facebook, et cetera, there are 584 applicants at a particular time. That's a lot of applicants. So the e one easy way for them to sift is you have one good resume, but you also have another equally good resume plus a good cover letter. 
who would you pick for an interview? Likely the one who has put in 2x the uh, a number of work, uh, 2x the amount of work, and the one that has taken the effort to send a good cover letter. So when it doesn't explicitly explicitly say that you should uh, provide a cover letter, it's a good idea to prepare one anyway. For my job, the future is one. I never wrote a cover letter, and I still made it through the next round. And another student who uh, recently worked, started working at Apple never wrote a cover letter. However, other students who got into Facebook, Google, always submitted a cover letter. So I'd say that go with the safer side, which is include a cover letter. And now that I'm doing this workshop, hopefully it will demystify the whole thing and you'll feel more confident to include one, even if the job doesn't ask for one. So some of you wanted to know if there are any major differences in the academic and non-academic cover letters. And there are, but in general, there are more similarities than massive differences when it comes to strategy. For example, with your academic, which is postdoc faculty, you want to keep it two pages max, 1.5 pages at the least. For your non-academic, non-profit industry role, keep it at one page, nothing more than a page long. Um, some people want to write four, five page cover letters, and that will work against you because your ability to condense your work in complement with your, if you're applying to academic positions, with your diversity statement, teaching statement, um, teaching philosophy, etc. The cover letter is just one, one of those documents. So you want to be able to keep it at two pages max. In terms of content, the two differences are when you're writing your academic cover letter, you're framing aspects of your academic training, research, teaching, publications, impact, future focus, etc. Whereas with your non-academic cover letter, you're framing aspects of your skills. That could be your technical skills, your laboratory skills, and, and translational skills. What do you bring to the table um, from your PhD training in terms of um, leadership and communication? In terms of reception and who's reading it, with the academic, the, likely that's the first document they're reading as soon as they open your CV or, or, or first they open your cover letter and then they read your CV. In the non-academic setting, since they quite often go through the, uh, your resume goes through the applicant tracking system, it's your resume that's the first thing that they read. And likely the second document that they read to distinguish between resumes is your, um, your cover letter. So those are the only differences, right? In, uh, in, that I want to talk about today. So going forward, I want to I want you to adopt my suggestions um, as you go forth and prepare these cover letters for both academic and non-academic cover letters. Because what I'm teaching today is the strategy behind writing these letters. So it applies to both. So before we get into the structure and content, I'd really like to share a few things that you should know. And then we'll go into the meat and bones of the entire um, um, how to write a cover letter thing. So first of all, you want to be formal and you want to be professional. No hey or hi and no ending with um, cheers or, you know, howdy or something like that, which trust me, like I've seen a bazillion different cover letters and they could they could range from professional to unprofessional. So you want it to be professional. Uh, it's never, never a repeat of your CV or resume. Now, I'll put a little asterisk next to that. If you've mentioned in, in your resume as a bullet point, you can take that same bullet point, but expand it. What I'm trying to tell you not to do is not just rattle off the bullet points in your cover letter as you saw it uh, feature in the resume. Every single line in the cover letter, as it is in the resume, serves a purpose. So when you're trying to trim, edit down your cover letter for length and brevity and impact, make sure every sentence is adding value. Each topic that you're introducing, a new topic, is telling them a thing about you as it pertains to the job. If it has nothing to do with the job and you're thinking whether you should highlight that skill, maybe you don't have to include it. Avoid jargon or generic buzzwords or statements. And an example of buzzwords and statement is, I'll give it to you uh, in a future slide, but for example, passionate, forward thinking, uh, data ninja, these are, these are buzzwords that don't mean anything at all but just sound fancy. So avoid jargon or generic buzzword because you don't know who's reading your resume. It could be a recruiter who's not a technical recruiter. It could be someone in the field, um, in the faculty field that has nothing to do with what you're studying. So it could be anybody. So avoid jargon and keep it as plain and simple as possible. And this is, I, I'll probably repeat this a bazillion times, but each time you prepare your job application materials from your resume all the way 
to your interview answers, you're tailoring it to the position at hand. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to cut, copy, paste the same format. Someone had asked, should I have a template and just stick things into a template? I would say for the most part, no. But if you're applying to two consulting firms with the exact same um, uh, idea, you could, you could get away with using the same template, but you would want to customize what's so special about that particular consulting firm towards the end of your resume. So the rule here is tailor your letter each time, tailor your resume each time. You're not a graduate student or a postdoc anymore asking for a job. You are writing as a future colleague of whatever team that you're applying to or whatever faculty department. So highlight your accomplishments and skills for a job as a future colleague and write that letter as a future colleague, which, which even if you don't feel it, sounds uh, a, a little bit confident when you're writing the, the letter. So we're no longer like asking them, or, 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 and I'll come to the conclusion later, but you're not begging them for anything. You're just stating factual elements about yourself. So now that we have all these overarching strategies in our, uh, you know, in our mind, and we know where to start, and we've understood the concept and the strategy, where do you even start, right? Where could you gather more data and pick up more clues to know what to include. So majority of the comments in the beginning uh, when you registered were, what can I include? What should I focus on? As with your resume and the interview, the clues are in the job description, right? What is the job description telling you about who they're looking for? What qualities according to them, not according to you, are important and it's the same thing with the internship. Understanding what the employer wants is right there in the job description. So when you dissect, tease apart the job description, can you tell what they're looking for and who they're looking for? And before you go forward, do you have complete clarity about what the role entails, right? And I'll, I'll specify this a little bit more. What did you learn from the job description? Say you have a job description, and if you're in your looking for a job right now, you're familiar with this. If you're in your third year, your second year, fourth year, and you're not yet on the job market, it's a good idea to just browse job descriptions sometimes to see what kinds of things people look for. So say if the job description tells you that these particular skills are extremely desirable for the job. Writing, research, uh, you know, doing research, writing papers, technical skills, problem solving, teaching. It's all in the job description. Then they also will give you hints as to what kind of qualities they want to see about their, their particular hire. Collaborative, teamwork, mentorship, uh, community oriented, a commitment to diversity, it states there who they would like to see. And then what kind of personality would they like to hire? Someone who's enthusiastic, has leadership skills, is a visionary, who's open to feedback, and sometimes this is stated explicitly in the job description and sometimes it's not. So keeping this in mind, know that all employers academic non-academic want to know three things can you do the job are you going to be a good colleague and do you have the the right kind of you know growth mindset and, and personality to do the job and get along with your colleagues so the essence of every phd job an underlying value is is just this so let's follow like the yellow color um uh, you know words on the on the slide so say you understand that they want laboratory skills, but they're also someone who works in a team and who has some sort of leadership skills. Upon dissecting the job, you've understood that these are the most important qualities they're looking for, then highlight these qualities going forward on your cover letter. So it's a matter of like studying the job description and deducing what would be the most important qualities and highlighting that on your resume and highlight, continuing to highlight them on the uh, cover letter. Next, so we've known, we studied what they want from the job description, but now the research involves what you know about the organization. If you're going to tailor your resume and your cover letter to not be generic, one other thing that you'll be doing up until the interview stage is researching everything. What are the values and missions of mission statement of the organization? How big is the department? Who works there? Who might you work with? What kind of work do they do? What kind of papers do they publish? 
you want to be able to systematically investigate or research all elements of, of the job. This will help you prepare and understand again how to tailor why you're applying to that particular job. You don't want to say, I heard it's a top company or it's an amazing department because it's at Harvard. What about that department? What about that company is so appealing to you? People want to hear that. An experienced recruiter, an experienced uh, hiring committee folks will know if you sent a generic or a tailored or customized um, letter of interest, letter of intent, motivation letter, or cover letter. So now that we have all our data points, we know what they're looking for, we know a little bit more about their organization, now we begin the work of laying out the cover letter format. And here's what, where I'll start answering all your questions that you submitted about length and font and things like that. So again, I'll repeat a one page non-academic, two pages academic. I'm going to use an example here from my friend from the Modern Languages Association, another friend from um, who's a scientist slash engineer um, who went into consulting, and a third is um, a postdoc from Hopkins who just got a job in industry. So I'll use these three examples as we go forward. But what we're looking for is one inch, 0 0.7 inch margins. Um, you want a font size to not be less than 11. So anything less than that is tiny and too small. Um, you want to, if you want to understand whether you can use the letterhead of your department or school first, get permission. And I recommend using the letterhead only for an academic position. You don't need to use a department letterhead for non-academic positions. Um, and again, you want to ask permission from your group's administrator if you can use the letterhead. You want to um, have three to five paragraphs, and we're going to go section by section and see what to include in each paragraph. But you want three to five, three to four paragraphs at most. And you want to include in the beginning, if you can see the format here, the full address of the employer organization, etc. Um, and then uh, what's missing here uh, is the candidates, the actual uh, person who wrote the letter, their address, it's at the bottom. You can have it up over here, you can have it above this, but for space purposes, this person has um, shared it at the bottom. But in general, if you're visually looking at the cover letter, this is how it could look. You have your little letterhead for this non for this academic position. Uh, you can remove the letterhead if you're doing it for the non-academic position. You have the little um, uh, address of the person that he's addressing it to, the date, and then the subsequent paragraphs. Feel free to add any questions in the chat box as they come up. So who do you address it to? What kind of salutation? Um, if you can manage it, it's always, always great to find the name of the real person behind the posting. If it's an academic position and you don't know, you could actually call the department or email the admin person in that department and ask for the name of the hiring, uh, the, the main committee chair. If it's a industry position, you can look on LinkedIn and see who's posted the job. Oftentimes the job, if it's posted through LinkedIn, you'll see a, you'll see a name. So you can take that extra effort to find the name of the real person. Alternative is if you can't, and sometimes it's obviously realistically, you, you cannot find the name. You can say, dear recruiting representative, dear hiring committee chair, hiring manager, but please don't use dear sir, madam, respective sir, madam, to whom it may concern. That's dated uh, and it, that's just too generic. So you don't wanna use like uh, these salutations. So anything else is okay. Dear hiring committee, dear hiring manager, dear recruiting representative. So that should answer that question. So we've covered length, we've covered format, we've covered the visuals and the look, and who should you address the cover letter to? Okay, the majority of the times, 99% of the time, I would see dear sir, madam, and you don't wanna do that. Okay, next we're gonna go into the content. And we're going to break it down into chunks, but overall, I'll restate three to five paragraphs. And you want to make sure that each paragraph leads into the next. So you're not talking about three distinct random paragraphs. You want to tell a coherent story. So pick two to three highlights from your resume that match the needs of the employer and communicate that. So when you're deciding, first paragraph is going to be your opening paragraph. Second, third, fourth paragraph is going to be your body. 
and the fifth paragraph is going to be your conclusion. So for that second, third, and fourth, or second and third paragraph, if you have four only, you want to focus on highlighting two to three things that are most suited for the job, and then communicate that to the employer. If you're writing an academic cover letter, demonstrate your current and broader research focus and its impact. Highlight your future research, um, keeping in mind the needs of the department of the postdoc. And this applies for some of you who are postdocs now and are applying to industry positions in uh, biotech or whatnot. Make sure that you're demonstrating how your research kind of connects with their work in their department and how, it, if it doesn't connect, how the skills translate over or transfer over to that particular job. But this is what you, you want to be able to do is really in both the academic and non-academic, you want to be able to match the needs of the employer. And you're telling them, I have done this, I can do this, and so I can do the job that you've posted. And that's basically the theme. The theme that is emerging here is that there's no point talking about your experiences that you think are important. Again, center the employer, the department, the school, the organization. What do they want to see in the person that they're hiring for this particular role? And then you want to highlight those experiences that will make you the right person for that role. Um, address any pain points or gaps um, that you feel like they need to fill. Address those gaps. Um, I just heard myself in feedback. So uh, if you can mute yourself, I sound like a little child. It just sounds weird. Uh, <laughs> I was thrown off by that. I see two questions in the chat box again. Okay, I'll answer this question. Uh, so someone said to mute everyone. So please keep your uh, mics muted because apparently someone can't hear me. And then I'll answer the question um, when I take a break in a few seconds. There's a question in the chat box. All right, so you want to be able to address the gaps that they fill. Does that, uh, you know, feel free to tell me if that makes sense and then I can clarify uh, as we go along as well. So, that's the overarching theme. Pick two to three things and I'll demonstrate it. I will always give you examples rather than just tell you how to do it. So let's talk about the first paragraph, the opening paragraph. You can open in whatever, there are so many different ways to open your cover letter. You can you can break the rules, you can bend the rules, you can you know, refer to a, uh, a referral in the first paragraph. You can talk about the one key skill you have. There are many ways to go about it. So what I want to mention is there is no set format, which is why I'm going to show you three different versions. Um, different people approach the opening paragraph dif differently. But what you want to do is you don't have time to waste and uh, beat around the bush. Cut the fluff and be direct. Why are you applying for the position? Who you are? Introduce yourself. What do you currently do? Why are you interested in the job? Mention the job. Suppose you're applying in a consulting role and there are several consultants they're hiring for. Mention which job you're applying for. Um, mention the employer. So it sounds like you, you know, you, you, you sent the right cover letter to the right person. And trust me, I sent my BCG application to McKinsey when I was applying and I didn't tailor it and that was bad. So I'm just reminding you from my own mistakes. Uh, you want to mention the employer and send it to the right person. Uh, and you want to include a hook. And the hook in the opener is why might you be the right candidate for the position? So find a style that's comfortable to you. Any variations of the stuff that I've mentioned in the yellow, which is who you are, what you do, why you're interested in the job, and the one line hook, is you can talk about how you heard about the job, who you spoke to, you can name drop. If you've ever spoken to someone who's in the company, you can add that referral there by asking the person permission first to include them on the cover letter, you can um, you can add that referral as well. OK, so what do you not want to say? I just mentioned what you should say. You don't want a long essay introduction. Like, I don't want to hear, this is, should not read as a personal statement. And very often, people will recycle their graduate school personal statements and show the motivation behind why they want to do the science or why they went into history or whatnot. This is not that opportunity to do that. You also have a diversity statement, teaching statement, research statement for an academic uh, job. So you have elements of that to address in those statements. Cover letter is not the essay that you need. You want to avoid any jargon or technical terms. Remember, who reads a cover letter? It could be anybody. It could be someone with no background in machine learning who's reading your, um, your cover letter. 
don't assume that the reader knows the terms that you're familiar with. Again, this goes with the whole jargon thing, because sometimes I'll be looking and I cannot understand. I know that everyone is smart and they do smart work, and I just can't understand the work because it's written in such highly technical skills. I should be able to understand what you do as well. Don't use phrases like, this is what I meant earlier, buzzwords. I am a forward thinking problem solver who is passionate about this role and want to use my varied skills to solve real life problems. Too generic, too generic, too generic. I could say I am the CEO of my own company and that company is in my house. I could say anything that I wanted, but it doesn't mean anything. So I need you to, um, when you're writing, to actually provide solid examples of the kinds of things that you did and the kinds of accomplishments that you've made. So no generic terms like problem solver, forward thinking, things like that. Okay. So let's go into an example. Now, I really, really love this opener from my friend uh, who was a BCG consultant and was a former scientist. And I always use this to show an example of a good opening, a good uh, cover letter overall. So I'll read it a little bit, uh, bear with me, because I just want to get through the main points. So he says, I'm writing to apply for the associate consultant position in BCG's Dallas office. So what job is specified? I am an advanced degree candidate with a PhD in neuroscience. And then he goes on to list all his neuro, his affiliations because the affiliations are pretty strong affiliations, Brown, NIH, Brigham Young. Currently, so he's telling them about their current his current role. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University of California, San Diego. And then he completely surprised me by then saying, San Diego is ranked number two in neuroscience for the US News and World Report. And I thought, oh, wow, he's going straight for the jugular right from the beginning, where he's trying to impress, 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 right? During, the PhD, during my PhD work, I studied mechanisms of drug addiction. Um, and then, um, you know, I published in Nature Neuroscience, which has a less than 8% acceptance rate. So he's impressing them right from the beginning, first paragraph. Now, remember, this person is a scientist who's never been a consultant before, but is trying to make pivot into the consulting world. So very strategically, they say, recently, I was selected among a group of dozens of applicants okay, to work as a volunteer analyst, so volunteer, not a paid position, at Tech Coast Angels, the largest angel investing group in California. Again, look at the words, largest group, 8% acceptance rate, at, to perform the diligence of, for life science startups. These experiences, as well as my previous industry exposure, stoked my interest in consulting. So this is one way in which he has gone straight and, hit and, and gone for impact, right? What job provided some background, made the connection to the role. So any experience that they've had as it pertains to the business world, he's put it in the first line and then um, show, showcased his motivation. Now, this particular person has broken the rules a little bit by using a second mini paragraph to continue to name drop. After having spoken with dozens of consultants at various firms, I'm particularly interested in the work culture at BCG. So now is where the tailoring part comes in. And he, in the way in which, instead of saying, oh, BCG's website talks about how they value, I don't know, uh, diversity or something like that, he says, I had conversations with Kevin Pratt and a couple of other names in BCG who then convinced me that BCG was the right fit for me and I would love, enjoy, I would enjoy working in BCG. I believe that my natural curiosity and creativity make me an ideal candidate for BCG. Now, I said no generic stuff, but he goes ahead and he backs this up in further um, paragraphs, so that's okay. In addition to extensive analytical and scientific experiences, I've had opportunities to develop the following skills that will positively contribute to the work at BCG. So the reason why he said extensive analytical and scientific experience is because it applies to that particular role that he's applying for. So out of all the skills that you accumulate as a PhD, pick the skills that are most relevant to the job. In this case, analytical, his background in science, and then he'll go on in his the rest of the cover letter to talk about problem solving, leadership, and communication, which are three skills needed for the consultant role in BCG. So that's the strategy behind that particular role. Now here I have a humanist, uh, no, this is not a humanist, this is um, a postdoc from Johns Hopkins who's writing for a staff scientist position at the FDA. And they describe the job, they describe their background, 
and they continue to describe their current research a little more detail than I would want them to. So up until this point, they say, I work in a laboratory that investigates melanoma. And then they go on to add, my research investigates how UV radiation, blah, blah, blah. I think they could have stopped at melanoma and added one last line in their opening paragraph, connecting them to why they would be a good fit for that particular position. So this is how you could structure your, um, your opener. Now, when you are writing for similar research positions in academia, you can, um, it's important to demonstrate how your current research and future research plan links to the needs of the position or to the research direction of the department. So think about that, whether you're a humanist or you're a social scientist or you're an uh, engineer, think about what is the department sort of need and then align your cover letter accordingly. You could talk about your dissertation or you could talk about your research projects. If you're applying to a university with predominantly like teaching roles, then obviously you would want to highlight your teaching experience. Um, and you know that, that teaching experience could be your accomplishments as a teaching a graduate teaching assistant, like courses taught, level of responsibility, class sizes. As you did with the resume, you want to be able to quantify even in your cover letter all your achievements. Okay, and then lastly, here we have a, a humanist who says he's enthusiastic for the particular role at the Modern Languages Association. So again, what job? And then he says, as a fellow of the Modern Languages Association uh, seminar, which means he's making an immediate connection with the role because he was a while ago uh, uh, also part of that, the, the organization, immediately making a connection with the role. Then he sh showcases his motivation and enthusiasm and then tells them why he would be a good fit. He says, my professional trajectory and past positions, uh, because of that, I'm extremely well suited to succeed in this role. Be direct. Tell them how it is that you would succeed in that particular role. And I will send you all these examples afterwards, uh, after the seminar, with the, the survey link and everything. Plus, I can send you the video recording. All right. So that's your opening paragraph. Now we're getting into the body of the letter. And at this point, I will try to see if there are any questions in the chat box and then answer them. Uh, I have a question. I would like to apply to an inter internship with a dream employer, but I don't know how to address the shift from holding a PhD to wanting to do an internship that is lower level. Is there something I can say in my cover letter to explain myself or clarify that I'm really trying to transition fields and this is why I'm willing to start over? Okay. So, so understanding the question, the question is, um, I'm trying, I have a PhD degree, but I want to apply to just get experience for an internship position. How do I justify that in my cover letter? You just say exactly what you just said. You dedicate a paragraph to explaining, um, explaining your interest in this particular field and tell them that I'm interested in transitioning. This would be a great opportunity for me to gain the necessary um, skill sets required to transition in the future uh, and also tell them what you could offer them as well. So you don't want it to be like you, your company uh, or your internship is going to do this, this, this for me. You want to be able to tell them that I bring to this role my unique perspectives as a PhD candidate. And then you outline all the skills that a PhD candidate would have, problem solving, analytical, blah, blah, blah. As, as much as possible, try to be transparent in your cover letter. The cover letter is an opportunity to explain things like that or if you've ever taken like a gap year or you've gone for medical leave or maternity leave for, for months and there's gaps in your resume, your cover letter, you can dedicate a paragraph to explaining. Now, I don't mean you would spend a lot of time explaining paragraph after paragraph. You would touch upon it and then move on to highlight your strengths and your skills as it pertains to that job. So hopefully that was helpful. My overarching answer to that would be go ahead and uh, be transparent. Tell them why this internship would benefit you and what would you bring to the table as well. Okay, so uh, we have paragraphs two, three, hopefully it's not four, five, um, let's say two, three, four, is the forms the body of your cover letter. Okay, there is no set format. Again, you could adapt to different, different styles. I'll show you two styles again. And very, very important, show, don't, talk about your accomplishments. Don't say you uh, are an amazing communicator. Show how you communicated with solid examples and, um, and same thing with your skill set. 
when deciding, and this is a common question, right? When deciding what to focus on, go back to your understanding of the job description and the role. What do they want to see? That's how I pick the two to three things that I would most like to highlight in my cover letter. So your cover letter does not have to be four pages long. It just needs to have two to three skills that you have that will make you a good candidate. Okay, and then this is the thing we miss. Whether we are a scientist or engineer or humanist, we miss this. We assume that the reader of our application materials is just automatically going to make the connections that I'm amazing and that I have the skills. They don't. You have to make explicit connections for them in the resume and the cover letter. Let them know very clearly and directly what you bring to the table. They're not going to be able to read between the lines. And I've learned this from my own mistakes. That's the only reason that I know this for a fact. The minute I started being direct and the minute I started tailoring, then I started getting interview positions. So I'm just sharing from experience with that. Okay, so let's go into the body a little bit more. What you don't want to say, again, a regurgitation of your CV. You don't want to highlight. It's hard to pick which skill to put in your resume because we develop so many skills in the course of the five and three years and six years. Highlight, you don't want to highlight and pick all your skills just to cram into the cover letter. That's what your resume is there for. You have a separate skill section in your resume anyway. So that's okay. So you don't want to do that. And you don't want to decide to highlight a skill and experience that are not relevant to the role. Suppose you're like super awesome at, um, um, I don't know, R, and the job has nothing to do with R, maybe pick another language, pick, a, pick another skill to highlight instead of R that's important to the job. So just prioritize the kinds of skills that are required for that particular job. In doing that, that will come in handy for your interview preparation as well. Because in your interview, your answers, as you tailor your answers, you will know what to highlight on and what examples to give when they ask you, tell me about yourself, tell me about your greatest weakness, tell me about your greatest strength. Same, same sort of formula and strategy all through your job um, search process. So question, how do I know what to focus on? And I think, I think I have hammered that point today a lot, which is folk, go back to the job description and prioritize the list of um, skills that you want to be able to highlight. So here uh, is an example of a resume, right? Like, so this is the resume of the MLA humanist person. And at one point, no, this is the uh, resume of the consultant position. And at one point, uh, they worked at this place called Great Call, okay? And you see their little bullet point, resume bullet points. They say um, increased, promoted, led, worked. These are called action verbs. And you start your resume bullet points with action verbs. The same sort of action-oriented outcomes and results are highlighted in the cover letter. By the way, I'm going to be doing a resume workshop uh, in April, first week of April, so we can get both done together. And then you'll see that they quantified quite a bit, 25 people, 800,000 people. It's all outcomes related. And they said promoted twice within six months. At that moment, I wondered, will people think that's showing off? Well, sure. I mean, <laughs> it could be, it could come across as showing off a skill, but it's not showing off if it's factual. So if you've been promoted twice in six months, feel free to say that you were promoted twice in six months. So the reason why I'm showing you these resume bullet points is now that he has uh, had, has this section in his resume, this is what he takes and expands upon in his cover letter. Because the position here demonstrated leadership skills, and he wants to tell BCG that he has leadership skills, he goes on to expand those bullet points a little bit more by giving the little a context and story around that bullet point. He says, I worked to pay my way through college. I was a consultant at a $210 million communications company. I was asked to align. So he's telling them the task. What was the task at hand? What did he do? Although I was given very little supervision in this role, I accomplished this. And he says, I established a working relationship that exists to this day. Why has he mentioned this? Because in his role as a consultant, he's going to have to establish working relationships with clients. So very strategically, he's aligned his past experiences with what he's about to do in the future. Um, and then, you know, he's very quant he's uh, quantifying. He increased sales by 60%, which was 800K. So every line in the cover letter 
were that was extracted from the resume and then expanded was turned into a little story and that story had outcomes and it had very tangible outcomes he's not saying he is um you know he's he's great at relationship building he's showing us how he's great at relationship building and the reason why he picks relationship building is because the role that he's applying to would value relationship building with clients that's the strategy i wanted to highlight um through this entire talk okay so his cover letter looked a bit little bit different instead of three paragraphs leading into each other he had three skills he wanted to highlight problem solving leadership and tenacity and effective communication and then within each of these skills he gave an example which was taken from his resume which he expanded one cool example is he said he was a teaching assistant in chemistry at university pretty much all grad students have, uh, would have done some sort of teaching assignment but he takes that simple basic teaching assignment and then he dresses it up for the cover letter he says he taught 25 undergraduate students and then he had one on one sessions with struggling students and out of those struggling out of those students three of them ended up going to the uh, doing their mcat and went into medical school So he took that basic teaching experience and 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 took us through the entire journey of what happened when he was a teaching assistant, and that's important because he says when I taught, it taught me to adapt to the needs of various students and tailor my communication to their circumstances. Brilliant, you know why? Because he's talking about how his future role as a consultant is going to pan out. So that's uh, an example of taking. Again, you'll have these this PowerPoint, and you'll also get. the sample letter that i'm going to share with you um and the same thing with the humanities person they took their bullet points and then they expanded that into their uh their cover letter and i'll share with you that example so so same thing that i took out a section of the humanists cover letter and it has everything to do with their past role you know they even put in their resume that they were a, a clerk at trader joe's and how trader joe's experience helped him with customer service and dealing with clients and things like that so when you are wondering how to translate your past experience into future tangible work experiences you can draw from anything uh, that demonstrated those particular skill sets so i'll let you read this uh, later on okay and then i'll uh, we'll continue on as well so i wanted to take a stop here because this was a question that came up how do i translate my academic skills into tangible work skills because if you didn't know how to do this writing the body of the cover letter would be a bit difficult uh, let me keep an eye on the time okay so research skills if you have research skills all of us do no matter what our background whether you're in the edd program or you're in, in engineering research skills can be translated into problem solving critical thinking quant qualitative collaborative independent these are the ways you would uh, you would you would translate your research skills into various bullet points suppose you wrote monographs papers and blogs that demonstrates communication skills suppose you attended conferences and presented your work what does that tell them communication skills relationship building skills if you know languages and some of our students know 10 languages whether that's fresh languages or archaic languages or current languages it's a super skill for your resume so um you know if you're applying to jobs that specifically favors being multilingual then add it to your resume and highlight it in the cover letter tell them the story about how you are so you know multilingual so you can take any of your past experiences just like that and extract out and juice what skills uh, came out of that experience if you organize a seminar that's leadership that's time management that's community building that's teamwork so you know i just wanted to put that across because this is what uh, a lot of us struggle with translating some of our skills to the current um to the current situation so i took way too much more time than i thought i would take so i'm just going to go through your concluding paragraph which is we're coming to the end your fifth paragraph things you could say you want to keep it short three to four sentences and in the concluding portion don't be abrupt don't just like go from the fourth paragraph and say thank you for your time goodbye you want to reiterate your interest and enthusiasm in the position in the role in the organization you might want to and this is up to you to do you might want to sum up your strengths you might you always want to offer a thank you and you want to end on a positive note so even if earlier you've uh, had to address something difficult like a gap on your resume 
you still want to end your entire feel of your cover letter um, with on a positive, uh, hopeful note. So things that you can say are, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all about the position and elaborate on the skills I have offered, I have to offer to the team. Thank you for considering my application. Please don't hesitate to contact me with any additional questions. Or you could say, I believe my three years of experience in machine learning, specifically working on automated vehicles, will be an excellent match for this job. I welcome the chance to discuss how my qualifications will contribute to your team's success. Thank you for your consideration. So on and so forth. Um, my expansive and expanding network with academia, blah, 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 it continues on. Uh, I've taken an excerpt out of the MLA cover letter again. Thank you for your time and consideration. So everyone that I looked at at the end, thank them for their time and their consideration. What you don't want to do is thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing you from the, hearing from you in the near future, in the new future, near future. Um, all I ask for you to consider my blah blah blah. You don't want to be jargony and um, you know fancy the end. Keep it simple. You don't want to sound too desperate. Um, you you are a future colleague, so you don't want to ask them for a role, and you don't want to be extremely generic as well. So that's your fifth paragraph. The main portion is your original hook in your uh, in your paragraph number one. What skills you plan to highlight in the body, and then a conclusion it could be any of these kinds of examples. Make it your own. Okay. So last but not least, I saw a resume once that was supposed to say, I mean, cover letter that's supposed to say, uh, sincerely Doug, and then says, said sincerely dog. Cover proof, uh, read your letter, make sure you, you know, have other people read it, like send your, after this talk, you have a cover letter for me to look at, watch the talk, look at the examples, send me a cover letter to, to look at, so I'll look at it. Uh, write, edit, write, edit, restructure, cut, trim, go with your fourth iteration of your cover letter rather than uh, your very first uh, production. You want to be able to, you know, get it to a point that you feel comfortable and it looks good. Check your grammars and typos. And then at the end, see if your resume and cover letter go hand in hand and that you're not repeating your resume unnecessarily. And then check to see if you've portrayed the skills that match the need of the advisor, the department, the internship, and the role in general. Okay. And then overarching, here we have, of, of, you know, putting it all together. You have the address, you have the salutation, you have the opening intro, who, why, what. You have the two, three body uh, uh, paragraphs where you expand your two, three experiences. And then you add your conclusion, which is restating your interest and your enthusiasm. And then I ran through that last portion, but I literally went back and looked at each of your questions and I see that uh, I've addressed most of it, like format and length, what should I focus on, how do I balance skills, accomplishments, and showcasing interests, how do I parlay my academic skills to tangible work skills, and uh, two things that I want to mention here that were questions that didn't fit into my, my PowerPoint were when transitioning to industry, how do, I how do I portray my academic skills and translate that to industry, I kind of gave you an example earlier. Highlight how your PhD training gives you the skills for the role outlined in the job description. And I gave you like solid examples. If you've done research, if you've published, what does that mean? Take that translational skills for your industry positions. And then uh, you would ask, one person had asked, uh, can you address any gaps in your resume in the letter? Absolutely. Um, there are always, you can, you, can, you can always dedicate a small two to three sentences explaining any gaps and again, once you've acknowledged it, move on to highlight your strengths um, as it pertains to the particular job. So any questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat box, but any questions on what I have um, shared thus far? Was that helpful? I'll stop sharing so I can address any questions that you may have. Feel free to turn your, um, oh, thank you. Okay, I see claps. Claps are good, right? <laughs> Hi, Ben. Uh, feel free to, to ask any question now or later. I'm just gonna you know, compile all the information and um, 
send send it all to you together. Just give me like a minute, a day or something to send it across. I will also send you, and I, I hope you'll be able to fill it out, a survey. I hadn't sent out a feedback form for months to protect my own mental health, but this time I'm going to um, send out a little bit of a feedback along with my slides. What about gaps in terms of not having experience in something that the job posts ask for? Should I say I don't know how to do this, but I learned quickly? Okay, yeah, I, I remember you asking this question. The question is, how do I... Uh, if I don't have exact skill for that particular job, can I say in the cover letter, I don't know how to do this, but I learn quickly? Sure. Why not? You can say, I don't know how to do this. You, you, can, you, you can say, I don't know how to do this, but I can learn quickly. For example, in the past, I didn't know anything about R as a, as a person in the humanities, but I taught myself R. I went and I did the coursework. I taught myself um, uh, I know how to do it. You know, I learn quickly. Demonstrate how you can learn quickly is my point. So you can admit if you don't know anything, but give an example of how you've done it in the past. Because for them, they extrapolate what you've done in the past to predict what you can do in the future. And that's essentially what an interview uh, question will also be. In terms of researching the company, do you have any tips? Like what are the divisions, size of the divisions, role of other people, etc.? Okay, yes. So in terms of company, you can always go, I don't know if you're, uh, you have a LinkedIn page, but when you have, when you, all companies are listed on LinkedIn, when you go to their company LinkedIn page, it will tell you what size the company is, mid-size, 50 to 100 people, 1,000 to 2,000. It's all detailed over there. And then you just have to put in a few keywords on your LinkedIn or Google search uh, for the department. Suppose it's the, uh, um, I don't know, neuro, uh, neurogenetics department at Spark Therapeutics, which is in Philadelphia. Put the two together and see who come up and start researching a little bit about them and start looking up their papers on PubMed or things like that to get a paint a picture and put together pieces of the puzzle for more information that you might need. So my suggestions are use the Google search, use the LinkedIn search feature, which is amazing, amazing resource. Uh, in terms of the Google search, when you do that, all sorts of things come up. Like I learned Spark Therapeutics was acquired by another company. And you can use that information in your interview. So research always. We're good at this, all of us. We can research anything. So use that same approach as if you were researching for your uh, experiment, your hypothesis. Like do all the background research. Okay. Do I, uh, do I have to address any gaps in the cover letter if it involves a failure, which I overcame, without trying to blame any organization? Uh, no, I mean, the question is, should I, should I address any gaps if it involves a failure? I would stay away from directly pointing, like, you know, highlighting the open wound at that point. I think there'll be an opportunity for you to do that during the interview um, because they may ask you a question, tell me about your the time that you failed and you might be able to use that answer there. So I wouldn't just be you know, direct at that moment and say every bad thing that happened, I think highlight your strengths rather than focusing on the weaknesses. Um, that sort of gap, I don't think you should address in the cover letter just of yet. You can address it during the interview. And you don't want to do any organizational blame or anything like that either. You want to keep it positive, hopeful, and stick to your strengths. There will be plenty of time to be questioned on those features during the interview, during your behavioral style interview questions. Yeah, just yeah, I wouldn't just display the wound out for everyone to see. Any other questions? I have one, uh, Roshni. Yeah. Um, is there any reason to lean on quantifiables versus non-quantifiables? Like, for example, number of papers, uh, students who have graduated or classes taught versus things that are a little bit harder to put numbers to? Like, is there any reason to lean one way or the other or should both be considered equal and be included? So lean one way towards quant or lean another way towards qualitative? Yeah. Stuff? Okay. Um, so what does quant offer you? 
when you highlight quant you know uh, outcomes like that it just gives them an example of you being results oriented which i hope your resume would anyway highlight if you taught 25 students then you'll say 25 students that's what quant offers you if uh, the if the job description says proven ability to do something then you may want to use the quant lean on the quant a little bit more as a proof that what i when i undertook that activity it led to an outcome um so that's when quant would come i would say quant quantifying is always a good idea because that's the only like uh, uh, you know that's the only tangible proof of our outcomes and our results that's right there and with phd folks data always speaks louder than feelings so i would say stick to the facts if it's factual add it in there if it's quantifiable add it to there for me there's an advantage in leaning towards the quant and i'm saying that even to the humanists in the room like i don't mean like quant skills i mean if you can quantify how many conferences you attended how many papers you published how many books you've written do that because that shows that you've put in the work and that work led to something and there's something to show for it so yeah that's when you would lean on the quant aspect it really Thank also you. depends on the job description um, and the industry uh okay no no worries thank you for stopping by i'm just reading a message in the chat saying bye all right if there are no more questions i mean feel free to um feel free to uh, email me any questions or come to one of my cover letter drop-ins or my one-on-one -on -one drop ins so i'll see you guys later thank you for joining you're welcome thank you you're welcome Thanks, Matt.